Perfect. All right. Uh, welcome so much. Uh, welcome to everybody today. Uh, we are going to uh, have a great session. Excellent uh, content. Uh, one of my favorite faculty um, who's such a huge supporter um, of alumni. It is my pleasure to um, introduce you to um, Dr. Ray Hawkins. He has been engaged in clinical health psychology and research for over 40 years beginning in his doctoral studies in the Human Feeding Library of Dr. Elliot Steller and Dr. Albert Stuntgard at the University of Pennsylvania. He has conducted research on binge eating disorder and in obese and normal weight individuals. And my goodness, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get through the entire bio. No. No, not here, uh, but I do want to let everyone know that um, he has been a um, since 2004 a core faculty member in the clinical psychology program here at Fielding Graduate University, where he continues uh, this uh, his research. Um, let's see what else should I go through. I'm going to get the highlights. His other research projects include studying evidence-based assessment and interventions in two practice network se sessions in the UT Austin Clinical Psychology Training Clinic and the Fielding Training Clinic at the New Life Institute, which he directs. And uh, Dr. Hawkins, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about your presentation, which is titled Research and Applications of Psychological Type Theory for Assessment and Treatment, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Hillary, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming today. I'm talking about one of my great passions, besides my interest in obesity and binge eating and addictive behavior in general, um, I've been interested in the Myers-Briggs type indicator applications in clinical and counseling psychology for 40 years. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And now you should see my screen with my slideshow. And also I have uploaded a PDF of this presentation, which I think you should be able to download, although I don't know how you will do that. So let's go ahead and begin. Hopefully. Okay, here we are. So my title, as Hillary said, is about research and applications of psychological type theory for assessment and treatment in mental health. Here are some references for your information. If any of you have trouble finding these, please let me know and I will make them available to you. I also have many unpublished posters and papers on a web page called ResearchGate. That's one word, ResearchGate. And you can download them for free from there. So the overview is that psychological assessment and treatment usually focuses on psychopathology, on illness, rather than healthy personality strengths. In this workshop, we want to show the value of including the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, or MBTI as I'll refer to it, in psychological assessments and interventions for practice and also for training and research. I will show you how to use the MBTI to supplement problem-focused measures, particularly the MMPI-2, using data from the Fielding Training Clinic at New Life Institute. It's a practice research network that I started in 2005. So the goals are three, to understand MBTI psychological type theory for the identification and appreciation of differences, to apply the MBTI for mapping patterns of healthy personality and patterns of symptom expression, and to learn how to combine the MBTI and the MMPI too for use in a therapeutic assessment discussion session. Now, I imagine that most of you have quite a bit of awareness about psychological types and the Myers-Briggs type indicator, but bear with me in case there are some that do not, I'm going to provide an overview. So psychological types differ from continuous personality traits, which academic psychologists usually study. 
the history of the MBTI is that around the end of the First World War, Catherine Briggs and her daughter, Isabel Briggs, became very interested, particularly the mother, in typing people that would come to social events that uh, the family had in, in the Washington DC area because Lyman Briggs, the father, was a prominent person in the Bureau of Standards. So Catherine developed her own little Cardex system for typing people. And then in 1921, which, was, which is now uh, 100 years ago, C.G. Jung published Psychological Types. And that was when it was available in English. And Catherine Briggs said, well, gee, we don't need to develop our own theory. We already have uh, Jung's theory. So from that point on, um, she adopted it. Now, Isabel went on to marry someone who was very different from her in psychological type, and then uh, had two children and published a couple of mystery novels. But then World War II happened and Isabel and her mother um, were very concerned about Hitler and fascism. And Isabel devoted herself to further developing her mother's instrument to help the world appreciate differences rather than to judge them. She called her instrument the Briggs-Myers type indicator, but BMTI didn't have a very good connotation. So she switched it around to MBTI. Now in a minute, we'll see the preference dichotomies in this typology the two attitudes, extroversion and introversion, and the four functions, sensing, intuition, thinking, and feeling, which yield together 16 MBTI types. We'll talk very briefly about type dynamics and type development, which can be a complex topic. And I want you to know that the current version of the MBTI is Form M. It is published by the Myers-Briggs Company, which used to be called the Consulting Psychologist Press in California. We'll talk a little bit about the proper ethical administration interpretation of the MBTI. So here's the quick overview. So the four preference dichotomies, each with two opposite preferences, starting with energy, extroversion or introversion, then attention, how we pay attention to things in our world, sensing or intuition, decisions, thinking or feeling, and lifestyle, how much order we like, judging or perceiving. For examples of these, I'm not gonna read these, you can see extroversion items here as to where you put your attention and get your energy. Let you read that for a second. And then introversion, the opposite pole, and it's important to note that this particular indicator, the MBTI, is pretty unique in that uh, either pole that you prefer is equally socially desirable. So it is okay to be an introvert. I am one of them, and indeed almost 50% of the population seems to prefer introversion. See, these are not negatively connotated at all. Here's sensing or intuition the way you focus to get your basic information uh, to uh, concrete or known facts in the present. That's what you see here. Or intuition, paying attention more to impressions, theories, abstractions, including future possibilities and potentials, abstract theories, symbols, and then how you base your decisions, do you base them on logic or do you base them on your subjective values and particularly how people are influenced by these decisions. So here's the thinking preference, the logic focus. And here is the feeling preference on values and on weighing decisions in terms of what people's reactions will be. So feeling here does not mean emotion. Feeling here means about 
interpersonal based subjective values. These are rational. They're not irrational, but they're more personal rather than impersonal or, or logic based. And here's judging or perceiving how you deal with the outside world. Uh, do you like to reach closure rapidly and have things planned or organized in advance? That's a judging preference. Or do you like to leave the options open and then be more spontaneous and flexible, making your decision, dealing with the world at the right time? That's perceiving. So from this, some of you, if you haven't taken the indicator, will be able to get some sense of which poll you prefer for each of these um, two attitudes of extroversion and introversion and the four functions that Jung proposed, sensation, intuition, thinking, and feeling. Now, if you put these together, you get 16 types. And in the Myers-Briggs community, this is called a type table. So now it's important to realize that there have been criticisms of the MBTI that it pigeonholes people, uh, limits them. Um, I say to my clients and my students, we're not gonna stamp your type on your head. Um, uh, this is just a, a framework for understanding yourself. This can change. It is useful just at this point to, uh, to look at, at some perspectives. So the type breakdown approximately in the US population, as I said, they're about an equal number of extroverts and introverts in terms of preference, uh, uh, but about a two to one to three to one ratio of sensing types to intuitive types. The thinking and feeling preference is again, roughly equal with maybe a, a bit more feeling. And the judging and perceiving preference is also about equal with maybe a slight number of more of people preferring judging. And then you can see in terms of the frequency of the 16 types. And if you know your type, uh, you can see if every type were equally distributed in this matrix, it would be about 6.7%. But as you can see, some cells are overrepresented like ISTJ, ISFJ, ESTJ, and ESFJ. And some are, are much, much less frequent like INFJ at only one to 3%. Now this is the complicated slide and I'm not going to get very much into it except that if you, if you have read any of Jung, you know that Jung is all about the coincidence of opposites or the reconciliation of opposites. And there's a dynamic here in that Jung believed that when we deploy our attitudes and functions, we do it in a certain way and we have a certain dominant function, um, which is more consciously available for our skillful use. And uh, then we have an auxiliary function, kind of like a second in command, and that balances the, uh, the dominant function. Uh, for example, with me, my preference is INTJ, and you can see in the upper right-hand corner, the dominant function, capital N, stands for intuition. And according to Jung, this would be introverted, so it would be more on the inside um, in the way I organize my mental world. And then the complementary or auxiliary function would be uh, extroverted in its attitude. In this case, it's extroverted thinking, so logically uh, engaging the world like I'm doing right now, hopefully. And, and those two are the functions which are most conscious, most useful for us in our day-to-day -day lives. Developmentally, theory is that in the second half of life, which Jung believed was where uh, the spiritual integration would take place, we would integrate our, in our tertiary function, which for me is uh, introverted feeling and or I'd say around age 30, 35. And then perhaps if we're lucky, if we really are open in the later part of our lives, we may develop a little bit more awareness of our most unconscious function, our inferior function, which doesn't mean inadequate. It just means deep. It just means more unconscious. And for me, that's extroverted 
sensation. For me, when I take a walk, I like to not use words. I like to see things. I like to hear birds. And I imagine what would a bird be experiencing right now without words? And it's very, very relaxing for me. So I hope that you can, you'll have copies of this so you can explore this at more depth. This is controversial and there's not a lot of research supporting the type development or type dynamics table. In fact, Jim Rainiers, who is an experimental psychologist, retired now, he has developed his own critique of the Myers-Briggs. And I put this in here for those of you that are are aware of the criticisms of the Myers-Briggs. Um, and, and Rainier's had uh, these principles. He did endorse Jung and Isabel Myers that all human beings differ uh, with their own personal identity and individuality with these origins, as you can see here, that he did endorse that individual uh, type preferences are the fundamental unit of analysis, but he believed it was the single letter polarities, extrovert or introvert, sensing or intuitive, thinking or feeling, judging or perceiving. These are the principal three arranged as sets of complementary opposites. The individual preferences are free to combine with each other though, and in any order. So this makes it not just 16 types, but if you consider eight, um, eight, um, eight objects, eight things, and all the combinations of those eight things, you get a total of 384 types. And, uh, and so I, I could be preferring introvert, intuitive thinking and judging, INTJ, or maybe my top preference is judging. And maybe my secondary preference is thinking. And my third preference is intuition. And my fourth is introversion. So that would be JTNI. So anyway, it gets complicated. I'm not going to spend too much time with that today. I am working with a data set of 13,000 Myers-Briggs though. And we've coded all of those in this more complicated way to see if we can uh, get more uh, fine grain grained details to uh, appreciate differences among people. These type preferences add together. And, um, but also uh, our type preferences are influenced by our context, our situational context, and, and we can bring out certain of our, our skills more readily in certain situations. And indeed, Isabel Briggs, Myers, and Mary McCauley, who was one of her students, believed that, that um, good type development is the skillful use of our preferences according to the situation. And there's a couple more principles here. Um, I'll particularly call your attention to principle nine, these principles are not cast in concrete, but are subject to change. So there's no stamping on the forehead. Now, I've been a little bit heavy with theory. So now uh, Dilbert, I think, is an INTJ engineer. And so you can read this and you can see how I hope I'm not going to put you to sleep with all of my theory. We'll, we'll wake you up in a little bit and not have to carry you out. So. Um, so a little bit about the ethical administration and interpretation of the MBTI. Uh, you go through a training course to use the MBTI. And part of that's a verification that when you administer the MBTI uh, in an individual or group setting, you want to give feedback to the individual. You want to help the individual to test out the goodness of fit of their four letter Myers-Briggs type you also want to help them to uh, try it on for size for a while. And Isabel Myers used to have this phrase, we want you to understand your shoes off self, the way you naturally are, not the way you are in terms of uh, 
the way you want to appear for a job and so forth. The repository of data, a lot of data and, and articles and presentations and um, the background research of Isabel Myers and Mary McCauley and others is called CAPT. That stands for the Center for the Application of Psychological Type. It's in Gainesville, Florida, and it's capt.org. You can go there. You can access a lot of materials online in the, their library online. It's called Milo. And that includes the Journal of Psychological Type, uh, which was published for about uh, 30 years, actually maybe closer to 40 years. And you can download uh, PDFs from the library with permission. The International Association is called the APTI, the Association of Psychological Type International. There are active chapters in many countries around the world, including the British Association of Psychological Type, which is having a conference in April, and the Australian um, Psychological Type Association, so, and others. Now, uh, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, if you take it online, it's going to cost you a bit of money, um, but you can get a good approximation to it from two main sources here. The first is in a very popular book by David Kiersey uh, and Bates called Please Understand Me. And the, the instrument is in the back of the book. It will give you a four letter code. And then one I use a lot is, um, is humanmetrics.com, which is free. And you can get a four letter code out of that. That's reasonably useful. So with my clients, I'll give them the official version I'll invite the spouse or the children um, to take it online. There are additional measures of psychological type. One that's really popular these days is Mark Major's PTI, uh, psychological type uh, yeah, inventory. Uh, one that is a little unusual, but you'll hear about in, in, in the case study I present later on, is called the SALTER environmental type assessment tool, the CETA, S-E-T-A. And Daniel Salter uh, thought it would be interesting to type not only individuals, but to type certain environments. So for example, think for a moment, it, you're in a library, you're physically in a library. What kind of environmental type would that be? Now, if that doesn't bring to mind a certain uh, image or experience, then consider the opposite, you're in a bar. And what kind of environmental type would that be if you just apply one of the 16 Myers-Briggs types to that? I think you'll see that this will be quite a contrast between the library and the bar. And then there are a couple of measures that were developed for use with children. Um, Murphy, my sky, or type indicator for children can be used as young as age five or six years of age. So you can look at the developmental unfolding of these preferences, this healthy personality style. And uh, one I really like a lot was developed by a good colleague of mine whose name was Tom Oakland. He was at the University of Texas at Austin and he developed a well-validated measure. It's still published by Pearson. It's called the Student Styles Questionnaire. That correlates very highly at the older age range of about age, up to age 14 with the MBTI, and it goes down to age eight. So this is the way that children can be um, used or can be given the Myers-Briggs, an uh, early version of the Myers-Briggs type indicator. So now we get to the main point of our talk today. What's the advantages of using the MBTI in counseling and psychotherapy? Well. Although it's been criticized, if you look at the most recent revision of the manual, which came out in 1998, it is a psychometrically reliable and valid instrument. It's based on Jung's theory of psychological types. Um, 1923, I guess, was the English version. The first publication in German was 100 years ago in 21. But here's what I think it does. It helps establish rapport. It promotes therapist neutrality. Uh, because, you know, there's no expert here. We, we, have, we have different types, and the goal is to appreciate our differences uh, by using a non-pathological language 
for discussing problems. It's equally fine to be an introvert or an extrovert, a thinker or a feeler, for example. It encourages change based on understanding of differences and increases clients' sense of self-worth. It's a great self-esteem booster. The MBTI differs from other psychological measures of the five-factor model, which is a trait-based model, like the NeoPi, in that it distinguishes psychological types, categories, rather than continuous traits on the bell curve. Now, in plain English, the MBTI and the related uh, free measures like the temperament sorter of Kiersey can be adapted to evidence-based counseling. Uh, use of these enhances self-esteem. The goal is to help people normalize to the good fit type, to the more positive manifestations of whichever of the 16 types they prefer. It facilitates awareness of communication style differences in couples. And I use it primarily for this. I think many counselors use the MBTI with couples because if you use it skillfully, you can maybe show that up to 50% of misunderstandings are type related. Not all misunderstandings, but contrasts um, in type preferences of partners. You can use it in family therapy. Uh, one of the case studies will show an application used in family therapy. And finally, uh, the major use of the MBTI is to highlight differences in personal and organizational values in team building and workshops like that. My history with it, um, I used to, I was trained at University of Pennsylvania and that's a very experimental psychopathology oriented program. Didn't really, they didn't even care about personality theory, let alone uh, Jung. They thought Jung was psychotic. Um, and so that was what I had thought um, until later um, when I was pretty close to midlife. And my first contact was through hearing about the Myers-Briggs type indicator being published at the time in about 1976 for the first time was published by Consulting Psychologist Press. That was called Form G of the MBTI. And I took it in about 1980 and I thought it was fantastic. I'd never read a description of my own personality that seemed to fit me both in the positive and in the, the negative aspects. When I say negative, for every preference, for every skill or uh, how shall I say, um, uh, strength, you'll have a corresponding underdeveloped area, which is a relative weakness. For me, it's stubborn. And I know at least one member on this call has heard or experienced some of my stubbornness. Um, and uh, that's a little effort at humor here. So uh, in 1981, I began to use it clinically in my work with the women uh, predominantly women who had eating disorders at the Austin Stress Clinic, and it was very useful. I could tell you many stories about that, but uh, in the sake of time, I'll just say that these women had very low self-esteem, were very self-critical, and to have them be able to appreciate their strengths using the Myers-Briggs was very helpful. Um, I never forget one client that came in uh, with her spouse. Um, we, I would typically invite the spouse. This was um, the uh, fiance came in for a guest appearance and he had taken the MBTI also. But before I gave both of them the results, um, I said, now, what do you, how would you guess each other's type? And my client guessed her fiance's type almost completely accurately. Uh, excuse me, the, the fiance guessed my client's type almost completely accurately, but my client, her guess about her fiance's Myers-Briggs type was totally off. So I, I, I asked her, I said, would you mind if we explore this? And I said, you know, think for a minute, read, read the description of this type that you think your fiance is, but it's not what he thinks he is. Now read that description. Does it bring any anyone to mind. And she looked at it and then her eyes got as big as saucers and she said, oh my God, it's my father. Now, I'm not psychodynamic, but um, you could see 
that was a useful insight for her and for the couple. Um, I then began to use the, M, uh, the MBTI in a chemical dependency outpatient treatment program I was a consultant for. And you'll see some examples of this toward the end of the talk um, in that the program used the MMPI two only and it really, and they would share the results with the client. And I was pretty appalled by that because I didn't know that my little um, interpretations of the MMPI for suitability for entering this treatment program were being shared with clients. So I thought that was an ethical violation. I said, look, if you want me to continue as a psychologist in this program, which is a 12 step program, I want you to include the Myers-Briggs. And then when I incorporated the Myers-Briggs as we'll see some in some examples a little later on, um, I incorporated that it was kind of like a sandwich you'd have the positive strengths perspective from the Myers-Briggs and then the MMPI, um, a problem focused measure would show how under stress um, those gifts of one's type are not uh, apparent. They're not manifest, but instead some of the underdeveloped weaker areas of the psyche uh, become uh, predominant. So that was my experience there. I've already talked about my use in the eating disorder uh, assessment and treatment. And then when I came to Texas, back to Texas, I'd been teaching there from 75 to 82, and then they brought me back in 98 to direct the training clinic there, UT Austin Clinical Psychology Program. I incorporated the Myers-Briggs into that, and we gathered data. Now we have about 680 cases in this practice research network from UT. Alas, they did not continue to administer the Myers-Briggs after I left in 2001, so we don't have as many there. But then in 2005, after I was in fielding, I wanted a practicum placement for my fielding students, so I um, joined the New Life Institute, which is a um, nonprofit counseling uh, program in, in Austin, and we started to administer a variety of the uh, evidence-based assessments that we used at UT, it's predominantly CBT-oriented, cognitive behavioral therapy, but I added the Myers-Briggs, and now we have data, um, uh, complete test batteries of roughly 150 to 160 people where they have MMPIs, WASIS, um, and Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, and the Myers-Briggs, so we'll, we'll see some of the relationships there. And then I, I dabbled in theory building, which I won't spend too much time on today. A contemporary of Jung was this uh, Dutch uh, psychologist whose name was Van der Hoop. And he published a, a, a book, which is very influential, um, which I guess I'll show you next. There it is. He called it Conscious Orientation, a study of personality types in relation to neurosis and psychosis. And uh, in looking at this, I, I was intrigued because Van der Hoop, uh, remember I was trained as an experimental psychopathologist. So I was interested, you know, how much of this is due to um, genetics, rear, uh, up, uh, what you inherit and how much is due to our environmental experience, what we've learned. And Van der Hoop applied, he didn't call it the Myers-Briggs because the Myers-Briggs wasn't there, but he, he applied the Jungian types. There are eight Jungian types, and this is all combinations of the extrovert and introvert attitudes and the four functions. So for example, my Jungian type is introverted intuition. And so he, he applied all those, but he said, look, um, there are static or structural explanations and there are dynamic explanations. A structural explanation is kind of like a constitutional explanation that normal or abnormal reactions may result from structure, namely one's type or conscious orientation, or dynamical causes, which is the Freudian, Jungian, Adlerian unconscious complexes, uh, trauma related conflicts, or both in interaction. 
And um, Vanderhoop said, this is why Jung had speculated on how is it that there's a choice of neurosis? Well, it's an unconscious choice. For example, why an extrovert with dominant feeling may be more prone to distress to be more displaying hysteria in contrast to an introvert with dominant thinking who may be prone to obsession or paranoia. So the structure uh, of type may channel uh, the way that stress gets manifested in terms of symptoms. Now that's related to a concept called differential susceptibility that Jay Belsky developed. And uh, two of my fielding students and I published a couple of papers, uh, Jeremy Jinkerson, Audrey Masilla, uh, basically uh, applying differential susceptibility of the Myers-Briggs. Now you can read this more at your leisure, but think of it this way. Uh, some people are more like orchids and some are more like weeds, like dandelions. Now the orchids, uh, if the environment is uh, nurturing, then, then orchids will become beautiful flowers. But if the environment is adverse, then that differential susceptibility means that they will not flourish, they may even die. On the other hand, um, some people, some types are more like dandelions or weeds, regardless of the environment, they'll do pretty good. Maybe they'll not be as beautiful as an orchid, but boy, by golly, if there's not enough nurturance and rain and soil quality, then they'll still grow. And so this is this idea of malleable versus fixed. And I think one can use the Myers-Briggs this way. There are certain vulnerabilities that people have uh, because of their type, just like there are certain strengths. That's why I called it in sickness as in health. There, there are differences among people related to the Myers-Briggs in terms of their gifts and differences also in relation to some of their susceptibilities. He also talked about, and this is relevant to the therapeutic alliance, uh, Van der Hoop discussed um, the concept of the personal equation. Now, this is an old concept that was even used by astronomers, you know, to understand why it was that people, uh, observers had uh, systematic errors when they were estimating the parallax, um, uh, when, when a certain um, uh, star would go uh, at the zenith. And some people estimated it uh, inaccurately compared to others. But what does it mean? The personal equation refers to the biasing effect of the counselor's own type it may have on observations and therapeutic interactions with the client. In contrast to the quantification of the relationship between the type and the DSM diagnosis or treatment outcome, the personal equation concept suggests how the healthcare provider's type may bias his or her perception and treatment of the patient. And so if the therapist is, a, um, is an extroverted feeler, and is dealing with um, a rather obsessional introverted thinker, you could see unless um, as Jung recommended that the, the individual therapist rotate his or her type compass so as to align with the client's type. If you don't do that, then you're gonna be biased and you may not appreciate your client's differences. You may say, oh, this person, I can't work with this person. It doesn't express any feelings. Um, well, you know, not going to express as many feelings because he's an introverted thinker. But with time and in the right therapeutic alliance, you will. So that's just a little example of how uh, Myers-Briggs certainly has helped me as a therapist to align my type, my personal equation to my client's type. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about the trait models. But I will say, as I said earlier, that the Myers-Briggs type indicator has an advantage in that um, uh, over the five-factor model, the five-factor model, trace-based, trait-based dimensional model um, are rated from a socially undesirable pole at the one end to a socially desirable pole at the other. Now the Myers-Briggs, I said, both poles are equally socially desirable. They're just different. So in the five-factor model, 
uh, what is psychological health? It's high extroversion, high openness to experience, high agreeableness, high conscientiousness, low neuroticism, whereas psychopathology is exactly the opposite of those. Introverted, close to experience, disagreeable, unconscientious, and neurotic. Those are pretty negative terms, but there was a paper that was published that I like to cite. It was a paper that used the five-factor model to characterize individual differences in terms of which undergraduate sophomores signed up for their psychology uh, labs, their introductory psychology labs, early in the semester. Well, guess what? The people that signed up early tended to be on the high end of high extroversion, high openness to experience agreeableness and conscientiousness. And I literally heard a graduate student walking down the hall in the psychology department here at UT saying, well, we better do our, our experiment early because if we wait too long, we're gonna get subjects who are introverted, close to experience, disagreeable, unconscientious and generally neurotic. Well, I don't know about you, but as a therapist, I certainly, or even as a teacher, I don't want to characterize half of the population as negative that way. I, I want to consider them as being introverted in a good way, sensing types, um, thinking types, um, uh, judging types, and there's no neuros neurosis dimension in the Myers-Briggs. The other thing is the five-factor model traits have not been translated into type portraits, configural scoring, where you take more than one dimension at the same time. Although the five-factor model has been used to map personality disorders, uh, Whittaker, Tom Whittaker's research illustrates this. Well, I know I'm being a little heavy on theory, so I'm going to pretty rush through this so we can get to examples, but um, um, this just says what I've said earlier. Um, we can turn the Myers-Briggs preference dichotomies into continuous score dimensions if we really want to, and if we do so, we find uh, very nicely that the EI continuous dimension correlates with extroversion, intuition correlates with openness, feeling with agreeableness, judging with conscientiousness, but there's no neuroticism in the MBTI. Um, there is a step three advanced uh, use of the Myers-Briggs that clinicians can take and that will talk about whether the, uh, the client is using um, his or her gifts in a way which is, um, how shall we say, um, uh, sufficient. Uh, that there's sufficient good type development. So in the MBTI, psychological health then comes in different flavors, the 16 Myers-Briggs types, rather than just uh, the high end of those five factors. And in another of our papers, Jeremy Jinkerson, Audrey Mozilla, and I have uh, mapped the Myers-Briggs onto different um, symptom patterns of psychopathology that I call wide band or narrow band. I'll give you an example of a, a narrow band. So this does not mean that um, every one of the types I'm about to mention will have these symptoms under stress, but there's a greater likelihood. So an individual that has a preference for um, introverted sensing, uh, uh, whether with feeling or with thinking uh, under stress, may be more prone to panic attacks. And I've replicated that, that a couple of times and it's been published. Now, another example of narrow band, it's kind of like a structural, to use Van der Hoop's orientation, you know, a constitutional predisposition under stress to manifest it in a certain way is um, a bipolar two or cyclothymic. In other words, someone who's on the bipolar spectrum um, tends to be, in my work, an extroverted intuitive, either with feeling or with thinking. Um, so as, those are a couple of examples. But in most cases, the symptom patterns are broadband. What does that mean? Well, if, if I have a problem with drinking and I'm an INTJ, I will manifest my drinking in a, in a particular way. 
For example, solitary drinking. I may think that when I drink, I can do my deep thinking better without anxiety. I'll do it alone. I had one executive, an INTJ, and he said, well, every so often I'll check myself into a hotel and bring along two bottles of vodka and I'll do my, my, my careful intellectual work and I'll consume the, the bottles of vodka, then I'll leave. Uh, for example, though, others, uh, it's been shown that college rule violators who uh, are get caught for violating curfews or possession of alcohol or drugs tend to be more extroverted intuitive types, ENs. And um, ISTJs tend to be uh, types that will use alcohol for self-medication for anxiety. So you see it's broadband. Uh, whatever your type is, you can use alcohol maybe for a different purpose, or at least it will be manifested differently. The other thing I like about the Myers-Briggs um, and even for research is that the MBTI indicates whole types that can be applied to whole persons. So have you ever met a person who is an average? An average is just not generally correspond to a, a real person. So that's my critique of many trait measures is that who is the average? But with the 16 types, we can apply uh, we can apply, at least as an approximation, that uh, this person's preference is ISTJ. And we can, uh, so to speak, animate that person. We can bring a group of ISTJs together and have them interact with other ISTJs or with their opposite ENFPs, and we'll see certain dynamics unfold. Whole types applied to whole persons and also to maybe to environmental contexts or situations if we type the environment like the library versus the bar, or even to worldviews. Um, uh, we presented some of my fielding students and I presented some data on political preferences. And this has been replicated also with um, the five factor model. What would you think folks? Um, uh, a preference for openness to experience, would that be more liberal or more conservative? Or let's say the opposite, someone who has a sensing preference or, you know, uh, uh, kind of low, lower on openness to experience. Would they be liberal or conservative? Well, it's pretty clear the data that people with a preference for sensing tend to prefer more conservative uh, political views. People with a preference for intuition, particularly when combined with um, with perceiving tend to prefer liberal or progressive worldviews. Isn't that interesting? So that suggests that even at the level of worldviews, at least in terms of politics, we can see this uh, systems modeling take place. Now I have some other students both at UT and at Fielding that we're going through uh, a database, um, two databases, the Fielding Training Clinic database which has data from about 300 clients, about 150 of whom have complete test batteries, including the MBTI. And then the others we're, we're doing is we're looking at this very large database um, from the Center for the Application of Psychological Type, 13,000 people to look at certain things I'll show you in a minute. We were testing the hypothesis that not only psychological health, but also psychopathology comes in different flavors. Um, to do this, we do, uh, we do type table analyses, which are essentially a way of doing multiple chi-square analyses on expected versus obtained frequencies of people who fall into each of the 16 types. So for example, here's a type table. And this um, is old data. Um, I'll show you new data in a minute, but I know you won't have time to go over all these, uh, these cells, but what you can see here is in a crisis, what do you do? These are women. Uh, what do you do in a crisis? Do you want to be alone? Like that famous actress said, I want to be alone. Do you want to be with people? Will you tell anybody or will you keep it to yourself? Will you seek counseling or will you not seek counseling? And you can see here, that introverted types, particularly introverted thinkers, 
uh, want to be alone and will tell no one. These are women. Uh, whereas the extroverts in the bottom two rows tend to want to be with someone, tend to seek out counseling uh, by and large, and they have funnel vision rather than tunnel vision. You know the difference? Tunnel vision means you just kind of use, zero in on the one thing, like being alone. Funnel vision means you open it up and you want to be with people. Here's the males. It's roughly the same, a few differences. And, and here's our replication with the 2010 to 2013 data from the CAP database. So it's similar um, introverts tending to want to be more alone or tell no one, males more so than females, and extroverts generally wanting to seek counseling and to be with someone. Isn't that interesting? I, I think that's very relevant. So there's some, uh, some analyses that you can do with these type tables. And a type table with analyses is shown here. And I'm just going to show you this one table to, to show you a couple of things. So this is the 224 people from whom we have myers Briggs's in the New Life Institute Practice Research Network. It's compared in this case with adult norms for males and females combined across the US, published by uh, uh, in 1996. And what you see here are the frequencies, percent, the percentages here are the percent of that 224 people that fall into each of those 16 cells. The I value below it is understood in the following way. If the I value is greater than one, it means that type um, in, this, in this sample of 224, there are more, for example, more INFJs than, than expected. Um, a number that's lower than one, like for example, ESTP toward the lower left of 0.19 is, means that there were much fewer people uh, in that cell in the New Life Institute database than we'd expect from the general population norms. And this will show one very interesting thing what are the types of people that come into treatment at an count, outpatient counseling center? Well, if you look at the, the, the number sign, the, excuse me, the quote sign, the number sign, and the asterisk, those indicate significance at the 0 0.05, 0 0.01, or 0 0.001 level. And we see here that um, intuitive feelers uh, tend, uh, or intuitives in particular, tend to come in for counseling. Sensing types tend less often to come into counseling. Isn't that interesting? Um, and that's been replicated in a number of places. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip through some more of these. You can look at, you can look differentially at particular diagnoses. I'll show you one. Um, if you consider social anxiety disorder, and I, this is a replication from some earlier work. This is a very small sample here at New Life, but in my private practice, um, I have a lot of social phobic individuals. Males tend, social phobic males tend to be INTJs or INTPs, and they're overrepresented here. Somewhat INFPs. So that's an example of narrow band um, type uh, uh, representation. <clears throat> Whereas the bipolar cases, as I said earlier, tends, tend to be extroverted intuitives. Um, these I values are higher than one in each case, and particularly in this sample, ENFJs. Does that mean that every extroverted intuitive is going to be bipolar? Of course not. But under stress and with more extreme tendencies toward impulsivity, then that's the type that may be more likely to get that diagnosis. <clears throat> That's how I think it relates. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to show you some pictures, not analyze things. If you look at the MMPI, there are 10 clinical scales on it. And if you look at variants by Myers-Briggs types, you find that the types um, have different profile elevations. These are statistically significant as a group. Um, but the trouble is that the MMPI clinical scale elevations also differ by DSM diagnosis, as is shown here. 
So you have to, we need a lot more sample size to do this. You'd need to look at particular diagnoses like social anxiety in this, in this um, slide for particular Myers-Briggs types. And um, that's what we're trying to gather enough of uh, subjects to be able to look at now. So I'm gonna skip through these so I can get to some cases. <clears throat> so what do we do? What is our test battery at New Life Institute? We do a clinical interview. We do a structured clinical interview to come up with a DSM diagnosis. We use the Myers-Briggs form F, which is a research form. We use the WACE-4, uh, and the Wyatt, the Wexler Individual Achievement Test. This is psychoeducational testing. We get a lot of people who are junior college students that want to see if they can merit accommodations for ADHD. And we, they poor, they don't have much money. So we have this very low cost for a complete psychoeducational test battery done by our fielding practicum students, 250 bucks. Do you realize what, how much lower that is than the community standard. Now we're not doing a heck of a lot of these, but uh, it would cost you 1500 or maybe even 2000 to do that if you were paying full rates. Includes evidence-based assessment like CBT measures like the Beck scales, the BDI, the BAI. There's a nice outcome measure that we get for free uh, called the treatment outcome package. It's a validated outcome measure that's kind of like the outcome questionnaire that some of you may have heard of. And I do projectives. I think that the TAT and the Holtzman ink blot have done some research on the latter are very useful, uh, not necessarily for psychodynamic interpretations, although some of my fielding students are psychodynamically oriented, but as samples of thoughts and behaviors and stories of interpersonal situations. And in each case, we do a therapeutic assessment, collaborative discussion. My good colleague in Austin, Austin is Stephen Finn, and he shows how it's not an expert telling a client, this is how you came out on this test. The therapeutic assessment is a dialogue. It says, well, you have this question. Why is it that you have trouble in relationships? Why is it that you have trouble at work? Well, and you arrange the data so that you can illustrate a possible answer to that. And then you say, does that make sense to you? Well, guess what? If you include the Myers-Briggs in that therapeutic assessment dialogue, you say, well, we're gonna start with some strengths. What do you think your personality strengths are? Well, let's take a look at this. And we present the Myers-Briggs type indicator results. <clears throat> And that starts us off on the right foot. Now we'll say, now let's take a look at answering your questions. How would maybe some weaknesses or some symptoms emerge when you are under stress? And then we present the MMPI and we do it in levels in terms of what's obvious, what's maybe not too surprising, or what would be maybe threatening if we, if we weren't careful in how we presented it. <clears throat> okay, um, so here back in the mid 80s was an example of how I made a sandwich. I combined the MMPI with the Myers-Briggs. And when you download the slideshow as a PDF, you can read these. Essentially, this made it much more palatable for the outpatient uh, chemical dependency clients. So this particular case, this is an individual whose Myers-Briggs was an ENTP. So whereas the MMPI highlighted passive aggressive features, impulsivity, immaturity, low frustration tolerance, the ENTP re uh, defines those in terms of ingenuity in the world of people and things, um, functioning best when able to spend time on special projects, where his intelligence and intuitive abilities can be expressed. Notice it's like two language coding. Um, you have a path pathological and you have a strength base. What do you think is more palatable to the client? Well, say, well, gee, I am creative and intuitive, but I can be impulsive and low frustration. Let me see as, as I get more sober, clean and sober, can I 
manifest my more healthy characteristics of my type. Well, there's a couple more examples. This is a Marianne, a female whose type preference is ISFP, introverted sensing with feeling. And there's another one whose name is Peter. And uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he uh, uh, preferred INFP, introverted, intu uh, introverted feeling with intuition. And uh, uh, it, it, it went over much better when I did it that way. <clears throat> so now, I want to I want to end with one case study, maybe two if we have a chance. Now, in 2015, a colleague of mine, Scott Meyer, from uh, State University of New York at Buffalo, <clears throat> and I published a paper on what we call the SKIM, and the SKIM stands for Structural Clinical Integrative Model. It looks like this. And I'm not gonna go through all this with you folks. Uh, if you wanna just take a visual take on it, looks like uh, a, little, a little critter with two big eyes and maybe a smiley face. But what it really is, um, it's a dual process model based on Andrus Angiel's personality theory. Andrus Angiel in 1965 in his book called Neurosis and Treatment had this nice concept that, that you know, we have a healthy system principle and we have an unhealthy or neurotic system principle. And if all goes well, and in Myers-Briggs term, that means if we develop type according to the way it's meant to be, good type development in the healthy system principle, then we will experience more awareness, openness, faith, love, self-coherence, psychological flexibility. But inevitably, we will experience some trauma. And the trauma cycle, in contrast, decreases our awareness, increases our anxiety, despair, shame, fragmentation, etc. And so the challenge here is to understand how type de develops as a function of primary attachment relationships, family, a larger meso level of family work or school context, which we can measure using the CETA, I said earlier, and finally macro world views. If there's a, a positive uh, advantage or uh, excess of positive rituals or routines that will support the healthy system principle and good type development. But if there's more negative shaming rituals and routines that will tend to lock people into more of the unhealthy system principle. So it's contextual. Now, I'm going to skip over this case. It's too long, but it's, it's what's in the 2015 study. I'm going to do this one and take about 10 minutes and we'll open to questions. I'm going to read it to you. Imagine that you're a um, family therapist and you have, um, and I did this for a while, uh, about 10, 15 years ago. <clears throat> I had a number of parents uh, refer their high school students um, because the high school students had trouble with ADHD. And it's interesting because most of them had been on uh, stimulant medications and had done okay earlier on in their elementary school years, but then in high school they were having trouble again and they wanted to know why. So as part of a, a diagnostic assessment, I administered the Myers-Briggs uh, to the uh, high school student and also to the parents. And then we do a therapeutic assessment feedback that you'll see and hear in a minute. Don, a 17-year-old Caucasian single male high school student, is being referred for individual and family counseling at the recommendation of his parents, former therapist, and his psychiatrist for a major depressive episode in partial remission, along with a history and current diagnosis of ADD, that's attention deficit disorder <clears throat> without hyperactivity, and a possible social anxiety disorder. Don's mother has been worried about her son's low grades, inattentiveness, decreased motivation towards schoolwork, and rebellious attitude. This pattern is especially notable in Don's English class 
where he notes that, quote, my English teacher worries about me and pressures me like my mom, but in a more highly caffeinated way, close quote. When his mother exhorts Don to study harder, he reportedly becomes resistant, but also feels guilty and disappointed with himself. Don's father is less concerned about his son's school problems as he describes having similar issues with inattentiveness and lower grades when he was in high school. Regarding Don's relationship with his former therapist, he relates that he liked her because she gave him some concrete skills for coping with depression and did not nag him like his mother. Don disagrees with his female psychiatrist's prescription of Wellbutrin, which he claims has not been helpful. He says he stopped taking this medication without informing his psychiatrist and has instead been experimenting with St. John's ward. Now we look at how the Myers-Briggs might illuminate some of these um, uh, matches and mismatches pertaining to Don's difficulties. So the Myers-Briggs type indicator was offered to Don and his family, as it says here, to discover how some of his difficulties might be exacerbated by personality differences between Don and his family social environment, and particularly to uncover strengths and positive motivations that would improve communications through the appreciation of these differences. So the Don and his family agreed to do the MBTI and we did the feedback and type verification separately, followed by a family consultation session uh, following Steve Finn's therapeutic assessment where the MBTI findings were discussed. So here we go. Don's reported preference type is INTP, introverted thinking with intuition. He strongly identified with the positive portrait of his psychological type noting in particular that it mentioned computer science and website construction as possible interests, which Don endorsed as his major, major motivation in school. Don's mother's type preference is ISFJ, his father's type is ENTP, and his brother's type is INTJ. Don wondered if his parents' MBTI types might explain why his mother worried about his school performance and future, while his father was less concerned, believing that he would grow out of it as Don's older brother did. <clears throat> now, let me pause for a moment. Don's mother's preference for ISFJ, in my work with my clients, larger, uh, actually well over 1,500 clients, um, the ISFJ, as I said earlier, was more at risk for panic and anxiety, particularly for GAD, ISFJ. So mother tends to worry. Guess what type tends not to worry? Well, ENTP, which is the father's type. If anything, seems to be a little more kind of on the uh, hypomanic side, kind of very overly optimistic, not actually hypomanic, but tending toward that. And the brother's type, INTJ, typical nerd. Well. I'm one, so I can say it. Um, so anyway, uh, Don's parents accepted the INTJ's, that's me, psychologist's suggestion that the father work more closely with Don on his planning for college and participate with his son in their mutual interest in competitive running. In so doing, the father would also help support his wife so that she would worry less about Don's future. So in other words, the ENTP who doesn't worry much supports the more worrying parent. And we, we have some data, by the way, um, which I presented, um, which suggested that for every ADD high schooler, where we've done the Myers-Briggs, at least one parent was a strong judging type, liked to have the structure and order and tended to, that parent tended to be the worrier and the other parent tended to be more of a perceiving type, which would be more similar to the ADD or ADHD team. And by the way, if you look at, at studies on this, ADHD children or teens tend to be more extroverted perceiving types, EPs, and ADD without hyperactivity tend more to be 
introverted perceiving types, IPs. And so Don is an introverted uh, perceiving type with thinking. <clears throat> In the subsequent individual sessions, Don and I explored the possibility that psychological type, I'm going to go through this a little faster, might help understand his social relationships. Well, his former therapist was an ISTJ, logical minded, concrete, she helped him build skills. His psychiatrist, likely an ENFJ, um, you know, was not logical in Don's view and uh, wouldn't debate with him the pros and cons of the antidepressant. So um, we also estimated, Don and I, that his English teacher's type may have been ESFJ, which in combination with a subject where he had less interest would mean that he would perceive her teaching style to be rote, pushy, and less logical. Now I say that INTP males are overrepresented among clients with social phobia, and Don had that tendency as well. They're less interested in feeling talk, less skillful in social exchanges, particularly when interpersonal sensitivity and tact are needed for effective assertiveness. You know, it's kind of like a Spock figure. Now that doesn't mean that all INTPs are this way, it just is a tendency. So in other words, um, this study illustrates how the client experienced numerous mismatches between his individual temperament and the available social environmental resources. Chess and Thomas have studied a lot about matches and mismatches and their developmental uh, implications. It is important for the therapist first to use the MBTI and similar instruments to reveal the matches and mismatches to validate the client's understanding of himself and his world. In other words, to discover his gifts. Then can then begin the second task of helping the client and appreciate and value these differences without passing judgment on self or others. Okay, it's a process of bridging differences by seeing their complementary nature. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> you can either, you can, there's a gestalt shift that Kagan has talked about in his book, In Over Our Heads, which is a great book. You can either see two holes at the end of a tube as two holes at the end of the tube, or you can appreciate that what links those two ends is the whole tube. And the Myers-Briggs, for example, is one of those linking things that would help um, at different contextual levels to provide a strength-based framework to complement the usual problem uh, focused approach using clinical psychology. So there's, there's my example. There are a couple of summary slides I'm gonna skip. Um, I'm just gonna to go to the conclusion and we have 10, 15 minutes for questions. I make the claim based on the data I've suggested, a lot of it is clinical intuitive data, but some is actually um, quantitative type table data. But adding the MBTI to psychological assessment and intervention has utility and theoretical implications. Um, and um, the MBTI maps differences in DSM diagnosis and MMPI2 patterns, and particularly adds a personality strengths perspective that may enhance treatment outcomes. So thank you, and now I'll be happy to take questions. There's some more references here. And we'll stop the share and open up. And Hillary, if you can help me with chat, I don't know how many people put questions in chat and how many just want to um, uncloak themselves and ask a question directly. <clears throat> yeah, that would be that would be great if you're comfortable or you can put uh, your questions in chat here. There was uh, one question I saw that said, um, I'd be interested in type and addiction. Would you speak to that theme? And that was from Jerry. And that yeah. was a little bit ago, so I'm not sure if there's a specific um, follow-up for that, Jerry, but that's one. Jerry, any particular aspect of type and addictions that you wanted to ask? Well, let, let me, uh, yep, yeah, he's trying to come on, I guess. Mm -hmm. am, am I on? You're on. <laughs> You're on now. <laughs> okay, I'm on. 
Um, well, I I appreciate it. It's, it's so refreshing to get, uh, again, your, your take on this. And I, I just enjoy it so much because it takes me back to the time I was in Japan when uh, I invited uh, Mary McCauley to come over to Japan. Yeah. And uh, that was a wonderful time. I, uh, I just happened to pull off my shelf the, uh, uh, the Japanese research literature from Takeshi Osawa. And uh, when I came back, when I came back uh, in 2008, I was teaching in a college in a side of prison and the prison um, had 3,000 men, 3,150 men. And they had, a, the governor would give a time cut for those who would go through a, a personal self-improvement program. And one of those programs was the Myers-Briggs. When they found out that I was um, certified to teach it, I, I, I offered to teach a 15 week class for, uh, for the offenders. And it was a wonderful deal, except it was frustrating uh, because uh, they cut off the program about nine weeks because the mm. funding was cut. But what we did with 50 men, and I didn't have a chance to follow up and, 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 and publish this stuff, but I wanted to uh, capture what it would be like for in their units um, to look at the population in a group of 50 men. If you had, if you had 35 men who were extroverts and you had 15 men who were introverts, uh, what I wanted them to talk about their experience from psychological type, what it was like to be an inmate and the, and the stress level for an inmate to be constantly around people who are, I mean, there's no escape. So it was a really interesting dialogue to have, uh, to lead the extrovert to understand what the introvert is going through and how to make some adjustments there in the, uh, in the prison. But what I didn't get to, which I wanted to do, was of the 3,000 men, uh, about 80 to 85 percent of them were there for sex offense. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, I wanted to follow up with a, uh, uh, some research about who is prone to sexual addiction, who has those issues with impulse control, the external triggers, so on and so forth. And so I never got to do that. But it's always been in the back of my mind. I haven't figured out I'm a counselor and uh, in my master's and was in practice for a while, but I, I didn't get a chance to do that. And that was uh, a loss for me, but I thought those men would really, and they, and they, we had the, it was the best time I've ever taught Myers-Briggs in a group. Uh, it was wonderful because they were so um, responsive. But but I never followed up with that as far as uh, addictive behaviors. And you you've done some things with eating disorders, or and and so the the, the parallels that what's going on and how people perceive. How do I handle the stress in the world, and how do I express that and who goes into those high risk behaviors and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So that's when I came back. That's, that was the. Thank you, Jerry. I'll, I'll just comment briefly. Um, uh, you, Jerry and others can go on the CAPT.org um, website and go to Milo um, and the research journal, a journal of psychological type and Marth Ann Luzader, L-U-Z-A-D-E-R. Uh, has some type tables for uh, chemical dependency um, uh, individuals with, uh, with the 16 Briggs types. Um, and as I said, in my work too, I, I have done, I, I used to be an alcohol counselor and we have data from probably a couple of hundred uh, individuals. You find it's broad, it's broad bands, not narrow bands. So I tried to suggest 
that the self-medication hypothesis seems to be true, particularly for people who are introverted uh, J types, um, particularly introverted SJs. Um, and the, the, and uh, they, by the way, will turn to alcohol for that. There's some suggestion that the choice of drug may be related to one's temperament or type in that uh, cocaine abusers tend to be extroverted intuitives uh, as sensation seekers. Now, uh, as far as I know, there are no type tables that have been constructed from either um, uh, incarcerated sex addicts or from um, people who voluntarily uh, and confidentially say that they have a sexual addiction and go to SAA or SLA, 12-step uh, groups, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous or Sex Addicts Anonymous. That would be fascinating, but my prediction would be like the alcoholics and like the eating disorder people, it would be broadband and people would engage in their sexual addiction for different reasons. But the reasons would align with the type and temperament. Okay, so if you have data like that, boy, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. And would help the people, they're so stigmatized, this population. They've done horrible things, but shouldn't they be helped to appreciate their gifts, their differences? Shouldn't there be some rehabilitation? I say yes. Other questions? Hi, Ray, it's Marilyn. Hi, Marilyn. Hanging out on that addiction stuff. That's very interesting. Oh, yeah. I like, I like, I like how you, you think about it because there's always this attempt to do this one size fits all. So if there's the self-medication hypothesis, it has to apply to everybody and maybe it doesn't. So this is a really nice way of making individual differences. I just had one question on the, that Vanderhoop article back from 1939. I've always been interested in therapists I've come at it through therapist worldviews, whether they're formists or mechanists and whether those match up with patients. Yeah. You influence me, Marilyn. That's got into the model. You're quoted in there. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it was, has it, have people done those matches and mismatches with patient, between patients and therapists? That, um, that yeah, article? there's been some of it, not much. Uh, again, the, the capped.org site has some of it. Um, and um, I've done a little bit with Jeremy Jinkerson, a fielding student. Um, he, looked at, he looked at my practice, basically, an INTJ therapist, and looked at, uh, at which, which of my clients, the types of my clients, did better in therapy. And it seemed to be there was the ones that were more similar, the thinking, the introverted thinking types tended to do better. Now, uh, there are some other studies that are published that suggest that, by and large, Therapists um, uh, who are attracted to Rogerian methods tend to be um, um, uh, intuitive feelers and introverted intuitive feelers like the individual therapy approach, extroverted intuitive feelers more in group work. So that's not exactly your question, mm -hmm. but it gets to it. Um, unfortunately, um, Myers-Briggs is not used a lot by counselors. I really wish it would be, it's a lot of fun. Clients love it, and uh, I think academicians don't like it. And I don't know, even in clinical psychology, uh, they don't like it. But I still kept my interest in it all these years. <laughs> oh, sounds good. It's been great to hear you talk about it. Thanks. Thank you, Marilyn. Any other questions? One new message. I don't know whether that's from Hillary or whether that's a question. I can't get to it on there. On my... It looks like a lot of people are saying, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there is one more question uh, that we can take before we close up here and I'll give instructions about CEs. Last question from uh, Karen. Would you also suggest CAPT.org as a resource for parenting and MBTI? Yes, I, I think that's a general place to go to. The other one being the Association for Psychological Type International. If you just Google APT uh, little i, you'll get that one. Um, but I would say I want to give you a, a, a name of a book that I think is very, very helpful for parenting using Informed by Type. And that's called um, 
uh, uh, nurture uh, by nature. Nurture by nature. It's by a, um, uh, a spousal team called the, the Teagues, T-I-E-G-S, um, uh, um, Nurtured by Nature. And basically that book uh, used internet surveys of parents with their children when they speculated on what difference it made, the parents' types and the children's types. It's a very informative read. It's anecdotal data. Um, there's no published data that I know of on that, but that would be the other additional source. You're muted, Hillary. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have the last uh, couple of instructions to make sure people get their CEs. I'm going to stop recording. Where